the screencast begins a series of screencasts on a design approach called iterative improvement. It's generally applied to solving optimization problems, and the idea is to start with some feasible solution and repeat until there's no longer any improvement. Now, here's a picture of basically these optimization problems can be thought of as search problems. And here's a picture of possible search problem that you might have um, idealized. And the big issue is that for many search problems, there'll be global maximums and lots of local maximums. And the problem that you need to be careful about is that you can get stuck at a local maximum. If you try to move just a little way away from this point, then in any direction you try to move, uh, the objective function, the thing you're trying to maximize, is going to go down. So you'll think you found a maximum. And you have, but it's a local maximum. And what you really want is the global maximum. There are many techniques, depending on the application area, that you use to avoid this. Uh, we won't talk about this too much because uh, we'll be able to avoid it fairly easily in the application that we're going to discuss. <clears throat> there are lots of important examples where the iterative improvement approach has been very valuable. Um, the two most important ones are linear programming, which has an incredible amount, number of applications. It's been applied to things um, from optimization problems in business, in manufacturing, all the way up to the traveling salesperson problem. Uh, Ford Fulkerson, which is what we're going to study in the next few screencasts, is an approach for the maximum flow problem. And I'm going to spend the rest of this screencast talking about what the maximum flow problem is and defining a lot of terminology. Then in further screencasts, we'll go over the Ford Fulkerson approach and in particular, a particular algorithm that implements it. So the maximum flow problem. Maximum flow problem is the problem of maximizing the flow of material through some transportation networks. What's a transportation network? Here are some examples. A pipeline system may be trying to get oil from oil fields to refineries. Uh, communications or transportation networks. So you can think of the interstate highway system and you're running a trucking company or airline scheduling. So here we have a example, simple example of a transportation network. This is the source, which is where this material comes from, starts from that, and this is T generally represents the sink where you're trying to get it to. And so you have to go through these intermediate nodes that are connected by pipes. You can think of these as pipes. Generally speaking, I think uh, think of think of this as a bunch of nodes and pipes is the best way to in you know, analogy for thinking about this. So what's the definition of a flow network? So we need an abstract definition that will be applicable in many different situations. So here's where we're going to start. It's a connected, weighted, directed graph. And to keep the notation consistent, we're going to label the vertices with the numbers 1 through n. Where one vertex in particular has no entering edges, and that's going to be called the source. And the Again, the vertices are this this vertex is going to be numbered one or perhaps labeled s depending on the application. We'll typically just almost always use number one. And there'll also be another special vertex with no leading edges, and that's called the sink. And that's numbered n or it's labeled as t. Finally, the uh, edge weights are positive integers. Um, and they represent the capacity along each directed edge. And it's an upper bound on the amount of flow that can go from I to J on an edge IJ. The fact that they're positive integers is not really a restriction on applicability, um, so I don't think we'll worry about that for now. So here's a very simple example of a flow network. We're going to work through this example very carefully in the next screencast. Here's the source labeled 1. Here's the sink, labeled 6. There are six vertices, or nodes, and the, here are the edges. So one, the source has two edges from it. The source has two edges from it. One edge from 1 to 2 with capacity 2, another edge from 1 to 4 with capacity 3, 
Also, this edge is its capacity is labeled just to reinforce the definition. So now that we have an idea about what a flow network is, we need to define what it means to have a flow. So what is a flow? It's an assignment of real numbers to the edges of the graph that satisfy two important constraints. The first one, which I've written at the bottom, is a capacity constraint. I think this one's fairly obvious, namely that the flow along an edge has to be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to the capacity. Just reinforcing the definition of capacity. The second constraint is that you can't lose any material in the intermediate nodes. So it's a, what's called a flow conservation constraint. The total amount of material entering some intermediate node must be equal to the total amount of material leaving that node. So for example, if we take node i, so vertex i, and we look at all the flows into vertex i. So i is the second index here. So this is on the edge ji. That's the flow. So this sum is the flow into i. This sum is the flow out of i. i is now the first index. And this has to hold for all the intermediate vertices. So basically, again, all this is saying is that you don't lose any material on your way through the, the graph. None of the nodes spill out any material or create any material. This slide just illustrates those definitions and shows how we're going to denote them on a flow graph. So the conservation constraint, here's the conservation constraint for vertex 2, in, inflows, outflows. Um, then the capacity constraints are basically indicated uh, by this sort of fractional type notation where the bottom number, the second number, is the capacity and the first number is the flow. So on this particular flow graph, all the flows are zero, so there's no flow at all, and the capacity straights are illustrated. So now that we've defined a flow, let's define its value. Basically, its value is how much flows from the source to the sink. And because of the capacity constraints and the conservation constraints, we know that what flows out of the source must end up in the sink. All the material that's created is in the source. It can't be lost anywhere along the line. It can't be spilled or any, no more material can be created. So it has to make it to the sink because of the nature of the flow graph. The maximum flow problem is to find the flow that gives the largest value for a given network. One thing to notice is there's nothing in these definitions that says that the graph has to be a directed acyclic graph. So you can have cycles. And as we'll see later, that doesn't uh, make the problem any harder, uh, just makes it more generally applicable. So here's a picture of our flow network now with actually some flows on it. So as you can see, coming out of the source, we have two units that flow from one to two and one unit that flows from one to four. There are these intermediate nodes. Notice that flow is conserved. There's one coming uh, unit of flow coming in from four, one unit of flow coming in from two to the vertex three, and two units, one plus one, flowing out of three into six. The flow value of this is how much is coming out of the source, which is two plus one is three, and how much is flowing into the sink, which is one plus two. Now, I, I will claim and show later that this is the maximum flow for this flow network. So there's two questions. How do we find it? And how do we know if it's maximum? We'll explore this in the next screencast.